only four of you? I guess. I know, where's my four? I have a story today about two creatures that Jesus made. Do you guys know what the first verse of the Bible says? You know the story about creation? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he that include that in me. What the two creatures that we're going to talk about today is an egret. Do you see a picture of an egret up there? Yeah. And a baby lizard. First, we're going to talk about the, the egret. You know, Jesus created lots and lots of special animals for us, and I'm so glad. But do you think you know what day the egret was made in creation? Remember six days? God created? It was anybody, any of the adults? Five. I see Maria's got her hand up. Day five. All the birds that fly in the sky and all the fish that swim in the ocean. Egrets are tall, skinny, white birds with yellow beaks and yellow feet. Have any of you seen egrets walking around? About 60 years ago, here in Hawaii, we couldn't find any egrets here. But there were some people that had a problem. That was cattle ranchers, farmers. The cattle were suffering from mosquitoes and ticks and flies and stuff that were harassing the, sh the cows and the horses, and biting them. And they got together with them. Uh, the Hawaii Board of Agriculture and Forestry, and they came up with an idea. This was an idea maybe Uncle Alika would appreciate. They got to think of, we need a natural bug control. And they thought about egrets. You know why? What do egrets eat? Bugs. They eat nasty little bugs, flies, ticks, little frogs, little fish, even little lizards. So anyway, they decided, let's bring some egrets to Hawaii. And they brought 105 egrets to Hawaii, and they divided them up. Two dozen to Oahu, two dozen to the Big Island, a dozen for Kauai, Maui, and Molokai. And in about 20 years, guess how many egrets were on the islands? Over 30,000. Okay, the other star character in my story today is who? A lizard, a baby lizard. Hey, that's my pet. That's my favorite kind of lizard up there. How about you? Cute little green gecko. Well, this lizard, the baby lizard in our story, is not the little cute green gecko that I like. It was a little brown lizard. I think it might have been this kind, but we don't know for sure. So we're going to call him a little leaping lizard. Okay. One day, a nice warm sunny day, Uncle Tony and I were getting some vitamin D. <laughs> Did you know you can get vitamin D without taking a pill? All you have to do is go outside and play in the sunshine. And we were just being lazy. We were at our pool, laying out on a pool lounge, getting vitamin D, reading our books, and just relaxing. And all of a sudden, I felt something jump on me. Now, normally I would scream and swat it off, but luckily for our story, I didn't do that. I looked down, and here was this little baby lizard. He was about two inches long, and he landed on my foot, and he just started crawling, clearing my body up to my shoulder. And I just, just kind of sat there real carefully, and didn't say anything. I told Tony, look, and we were watching me, but that was really weird. Why would a lizard? who was scared of people, <laughs> jump on a person. And we looked around, and here was this egret walking around the pool furniture and the shrubs and stuff, looking for supper. <laughs> and that little egret, that little lizard, 
without being with his mommy or anything, was smart enough to think maybe a person would be safer than the egret. But after the egret walked away looking for better sources for his dinner, a little lizard crawled off my shoulder onto the back of the chair, out on the top of the chair and kind of looked around and then leaped into the bushes. Isn't it amazing? The animals and how smart they are, the teeth to make the rest. When you go home this week, look around for the lizards. See if you can catch one. I did. I did. They're not very easy to catch because they're scared of people. I that makes you wonder why they weren't scared of me, huh? I can't catch a baby. Yeah. I can't catch a baby. I am so happy that when we go to heaven, all the animals are going to be tame. They're not going to eat each other. And they're not going to be afraid of us and they won't harm us. So thank you, Jesus, for all the beautiful animals you made for us. So much singing. This song I sing all the time, but uh, I asked my wife what I should sing, and she told me. This song is always a testimony to me about how he led me from the past to where I am today. So I hope you enjoy it and let the, the Holy Spirit speak in your heart. It's my desire to live for Jesus. It's my desire to be just I don't need 
I thank you, Val, for that story. 30,000 ingots. <laughs> 20,000 was being kicked off. <laughs> That's why all the geckos are in my house. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to catch a few now and see if they would like, if they would like to enjoy the pool. Our scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Matthew. Verses 42 to 44. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Um, I think so. I think it's on. Now let me try to find this one. Okay. All right. Wow. So high. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Beautiful to be here today. It's a beautiful day, and it's just wonderful to be in God's presence. I love it. You know, last Sabbath we had um, like a really joyous Sabbath. It was it was fun. It was Mother's Day. It was the baby dedication. It was just so many things were just fun and nice about it. It was such a celebration. Today's going to be a little bit more tempered, a little bit heavier. What we're going to talk about. But um, I don't know if any of you have seen, but Pastor Mark Finley has started a new series on the Spirit, on the Holy Spirit, revived by the Spirit. And there's a, a number of them. I think there's 10 or 15 um, sermons that he does on it. And I've been listening to them, and they've, they've really been impressing my heart about the seriousness of the time that we're in and what we need to do. And... Um, Anyway, so one of those sermons touched me so much, and it just, it kind of shook me to my feet, and I thought, wow, that is so right, that is so important what he just said, and so that's part of what I want to share with you today. Uh, the scripture, I mean, the sermon is called, is named, okay, urgency. Revival or both. And when we were having Sabbath school this morning and um, Delic was teaching us about Lot, and one of the things that he said was that Lot lingered. You know, he just hung out there. He didn't, he didn't want to make the move. He didn't want to step forward and do it. There was no urgency. But was there urgency in the angels? Yeah, like they grabbed their arms and just, you know, pulled them out of the city. There was urgency. Urgency means something is very, very, very important. And it's time for it. And, and you need to do whatever you need to do. And I'm saying that the urgency, the main urgency for us right now is revival. 
revival. You know, Sister White was talking to um, people, and this is, this is recorded for us in Selected Messages, Book One. And this is what she said. Oh, my gosh. She said, A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Now, those aren't little words. She's saying a revival, yes, that's what we're talking about, of true godliness, like really being there with God, one-on-one -on -one with God. This is the greatest and the most urgent of all our needs. Do we need other things? Is there things that we need? Yes, there is. And, but this is the most urgent. This is very important, a revival. And this is what revival means. It means to live again, to come alive, to return come back to consciousness or, or to life, to be restored, like when you take furniture and you restore it, you bring it back to life. It's about waking up, coming alive, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Well, while they were doing this and they were talking, somebody else asked her a question. And the question was, are we hoping to see the whole church revive? Like, is it going to be 100% when this revival comes? And she answers, that time will never come. A revival does not need to change the whole church all around the world to be a success in the eyes of heaven. It needs to change just one life, mine. It needs to change one life, yours. That's how essential revival is. It's personal. A revival is personal. Collectively, we revive and we come you know, more alive as a church and as we move across the world with our message, that's all true. But if it didn't start with you, it's not going to do anything for anybody else. You have to have your own revival. You have to be the one that um, wakes up and comes back to life. Shall we pray? Loving Father, we want to hear you today. We do. We want to know what your message is for us. We want to understand the urgency of the time. And that if you gave us this information, that there is one thing we need above all other, please help us to pay attention to it. And Father, I know that none of this message can get to any of us unless it comes to your spirit. And so may your spirit alone be the one who speaks and reaches our hearts today. Thank you. And Jesus is loving you. So the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just a power. You know, some people calling, oh, when it comes, or like when I was raised, it was the Holy Ghost. And my whole impression was this ghost floating around there. But the Holy Spirit is actually God. He's a person of the Godhead. There is three people there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are how we name them, and they are there. And the Holy Spirit is a, man, a person. He's a person. He has a personality. He has feelings. He cares. He loves. He's God, and he is one of them. So um, I just want to throw this new word in here for us. You know, when the Adventist church began, they weren't, they weren't all together on the Trinity. They didn't understand it. They kind of didn't believe it. And so they had to work through it. They worked through it through years. And Sister White studied it a lot. And it was very important to her. And she studied and she studied. And she didn't like to call, once she figured it out, she didn't like to call it the Trinity, the way we say it. They, she called it the Heavenly Trio. And I love that name. So I'm going to use that for now. So if I say the Heavenly Trio, I'm talking about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of those persons in the Holy Trio. He is the one that draws us to Jesus. He reveals all truths to us. He empowers us. He convicts us of sin. He's the one who leads us to revival, to wake us up, and to bring us alive spiritually. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be here. None of us would even care. The Holy Spirit does everything. We are broken vessels, and we cannot function on our own. We function correctly on our own. We have to have help from God. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who does that. We are so very close to Christ's return. We really are. You know, our timing is different. It's just like Gina said in the South School this morning. God lives in eternity. That, that, we can't even count that. It's a, we just can't count it. It's eternity. It's from then to then and beyond. It just goes on. We live in a section of time on that line of eternity. We're right here. And so for us, 
it's taking a long time for Jesus to come. When he said he's coming back, do you know how many years ago that was? It's a long time ago. It's over 2,000 years ago. So that's like a long time to wait for his return. But we're still waiting for it. But it's close now. Closer now than it was yesterday. Closer than it's ever been before. And so the time for us to enter into the promised land, to sit down in heaven at that marriage feast of the Lamb, that's what we're waiting for. We're right on the edges, the border of heavenly Canaan. We want to get there. We don't want to miss out on this event. We must be alert. We must be awake. We must be in tune to the Spirit's leading. We must be revived. We must be revived. Do you think those people that are over in Ukraine right now, um, running for their lives and trying to protect and to help each other and to get food and water to each other and stuff like that, do you think they're lethargic about it or are they urgent about it? Their life is at stake. Their life is at stake. Well, I'm telling us our life is at stake. Our eternal life is at stake and we need to start paying attention to what God wants from us. Jesus himself tells us, Matthew, um, Brian just read it in Matthew 24, 44. He says, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So if we're expecting something, we get ready for it, right? But this one, we don't have any idea when it's really coming. So he says, you just have to be ready all the time. Don't think it's, it's like... You know, just a day like any other day. It's not. Jesus is right around the corner waiting for us. So both these chapters in Matthew 24 and 25, they're like the closing chapters. They're not the end, but it's getting close to the close of the chapters of um, this Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus starts it with the Sermon on the Mount in, Matt, in the Gospel of Matthew. And he closes it with these statements. So in these two chapters, there's 97 verses. And out of those 97 verses, only three of them are commentary. The rest of them, all 94 verses, is Jesus giving us direct instruction for the last days. That's where we're at. We're in the last days. We need to pay attention. He speaks of 24 different signs of the times just before he returns. And do you know that all of them are here? Wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, all these different ones that we were aware of. We... Our church was introduced to this orphanage in Kenya a few years ago. And we made, um, we took donations for them. We wanted to help them out. And for whatever reason, through the enemy's hands, that money never reached them until now. They're getting it now. But this is years later. Years later. Okay. During these years, while they've been waiting for this money so that they could feed these orphans and take care of them, I have gotten multiple correspondence from them because they are just so desperate. They're desperate. They have no food to feed. And right now, they're in a severe famine. There is famine going across this world. And, you know, we are here in this beautiful, incredible home that we live in, and we don't feel the urgency. We don't feel we're not having famine. We're not having children die on us from starvation. But they are all around the world. And it's these signs of the times that Jesus is talking about is real, and it's here, and it's happening, and they're all happening. And the final one is that the message gets to all the world. Do you think our message is spreading across the world? Yes. Yes, it is. We're the fastest growing Protestant denomination in the whole world. Our message is moving because it is the truth. It is the message for the end time. The three, the three angels' messages. Everybody needs to hear it. Well, after he gives these different signs, then he gives a number of parables. And each one of these parables in these two chapters is all kingdom parables. They're all about the kingdom of God. So he's, he's letting us know the kingdom is right here. It's right next to us. And we need to start paying attention if we want to walk into it. Well, one of these parables that's most well known is about the ten virgins. And that's the one we're going to look at today. Now I know most of us have heard plenty of sermons on the ten virgins. And most of us have it like it's down. But I just want you to listen, listen to it today with a new emphasis, thinking about the urgency of the time. Answering a letter from a brother minister and speaking to the end time generation. Um, Sister White is talking, and she's answering this, this minister's questions. And she's talking specifically about the three angels' messages and the end time generation included in this ten virgin parable. 
And she writes in Review and Herald in August 19, 1890. She says, this parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Not one thing left out of it, to the very letter. For it has a special application to this time, the time we're living in. And it will be present truth until the close of time. So it's something that we really need to pay attention to. Let's go ahead and let's read the whole parable together. It's in Matthew 25. We'll start in verse 1. And that's pretty much where we're going to stay today, right here. First one of chapter 25 of Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So there's a probation upon our world. There's a probation on our nation. There's a probation on our individual lives. And, um, and we don't know when that ends. We don't know if we pass today. We just, three people had a tree fall on them. They weren't expecting that that day. Sister, we've been praying for her for, for a few years, diligently praying for her, and now she's passed. We don't know when our day is. We need to pay attention because um, when probation's over, it's over. Ten virgins. So what we're going to do is we're going to start taking this um, parable apart for the symbolism. If it's a parable, it's in symbol. If it's not a parable, it's literal. It means a woman, but this is a little different. So here we have, we have ten virgins. We're going to start with that. Ten virgins. So they're all women. A woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. That's the symbolism. A pure woman has not been tainted by the world in its false teaching. A pure church, it's a virgin. An impure woman it signifies a church that has been tainted and corrupted by false teaching. It is a church, but there's something wrong there. It's an apostate and adulterous church. In this particular parable, we're only talking about the pure church, the true church. Numbers are also important in the Bible, all numbers. 12, 44, 144, 3, 4, 10, 12. Um, they're very important and they have different meanings. Mean. And so here we have the number 10. We have 10 virgins. So this number is, is the number given to comprise a minion. A minion is like what we would call a quorum. You have to have so many before you can take your vote. Well, a minion is you have to have that many. 10 is your minimum to have a minion, and that's where you can have a synagogue or a church. That's when you could call it that. It, it has to have 10. And so here we are. This is a complete church. It's all ten. It's pure. They're virgins. They have the truth. They have understanding. And here they are. They are ten, ten women, part of the true church, believing in true doctrine. It, and, and as we look at them, they're carrying lamps in their hands. You know, they have those little clay lamps, and they would carry them. And they're going to the wedding, and they need to have their lights like us taking our flashlight. They're carrying these lamps in their hands to shine on their way. Our world is a very dark and dangerous place. It's, it's just loaded with um, snares and traps and, and just darkness all around us. And we think we're seeing, we think we're in the light, but we're not really in the light unless the Holy Spirit has enlightened our eyes. And then we see brighter. It's like having cataract surgery. And you get done and you go, oh, I see. Wow, that's what color green looks like. Yeah, so it's very important that we start seeing and knowing where we're at. 
But what does the lamp itself symbolize? This is what we're looking at, the symbols. In Psalms 119, 105, it tells us that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So what does that lamp signify? The word, the word of God, the Bible, this precious, special book that we have and that we treasure. But we can't just leave it on the shelf. It has to be guiding our life. They have the Bible. They have the Word of God. But yet we see that five are wise and five are foolish. The difference is found in verses 3 and 4. Now, they're all Christians, and they're all in the church. Five wise, five foolish. So in these verses, those who were foolish took their lamp and took no oil with them. Talking about extra oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So these foolish virgins came with their lamp. Yeah, and they're expecting straight to go right into the into the feast, and they're going to go to this party. But the wise took extra oil. They had a vessel. They had a special little container, another bottle that they brought other oil with them, and and it was in their vessel. So one of the things, think of our bodies as a vessel. Think that. The foolish took no extra oil. The wise did. Oil here represents the Holy Spirit. There are other symbols that also represent the Holy Spirit in Scripture. There is water, wind, fire, rain, you know, latter rain, former rain. These are, they're all symbols of oil, and they can be used at different times, but Jesus specifically used here oil. Jesus used oil, which declares total consecration and healing. How so? How does this work? To be all in for God. When the high priests or the kings of Israel were anointed, you know when um, the elders, when us and the pastor, if we go and we anoint somebody, we take oil and we, and we touch them with oil. But when these guys were anointed, the high priests and the kings, they took like a ram's horn, which can be big, and they filled it with oil. And when they came upon them, they poured it on them. They just poured it on them. And so the oil ran down, ran down their face, ran down their beard, ran down. And when you hear of like, there are new high priests, they've got these beautiful new linen clothes on, and, and I always thought, well, all that oil's really their clothes. I used to think that. But anyway, the oil, it runs down, and it just pours down them. And what it's really doing is it's covering them completely, from head to toe. It symbolizes total coverage, Total consecration, total commitment, all in for God. Not half in for me and half in for God. All in. All in. Don't keep anything back. Surrender all. This symbol is, is symbolized through the Holy Spirit entering our life. We want the Holy Spirit. We want a little bit of the Holy Spirit. No. We want Him saturating us. We want covered with Him from top to bottom. If there is no oil, if they run out, then there's no way to ignite the light and one's witness turns powerless. There's no oil, there's no illumination. There's no way for us to share our light with the next people. Oil also represents here a healing balm to heal us of the brokenness that sin has brought into our lives. Remember um, the Good Samaritan and the guy was all beat up and left for dead and the Samaritan comes and he cleans out his wounds and then he pours oil on him. And he comforts him with his oil, and the oil is the bomb that's going to heal him. Daily we need to be healed. Daily we need to be healed from the day before, from the month before, from the year before. We need healing. We're all damaged. We're all hurt. That's what Satan's whole job is, is to hurt us and to bring damage to us and sorrow in our hearts. We need this healing touch every single day. If you don't have it, what do wounds do? What does sickness do? It gets worse and it putrefies and you just get sicker. And you know, if you have hate in your heart or anger in your heart, we're told that whatever container holds hate, it corrodes it. So if this is our vessel and we're holding on to these pains and these sorrows, it'll corrode us and it'll destroy us. We need to be healed by God's Holy Spirit reaching us and comforting us and soothing us with this balm. Daily we must be. And now, now, the story takes a twist. In verse 5, it tells us, But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Who all slumbered and slept? All ten. All ten. 
Are these ten representative of the entire church? Yes. Who's sleeping? Everybody. Do you like me telling you that? Oh, by the way, you're asleep, really? You know, you think you're right here, but, you know, you're really asleep or you're slumbering. What's really going on? What do we really need to, to hear from this? This is the one out of all of it that really shook me because it's just like I got this little insight, like this little vision, and it showed us, showed me, me especially, like I think I'm alive and I think I'm working for God and I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but really, I'm this. And if you want to take another look at who we are, um, let's look at um, Revelation 3. We think we're okay. Do we have to? Uh, Do we have to? Yeah, we have to. <laughs> Revelation 3. And we will start with, where's later to see it? 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. This is the last church on earth. This is it. And we are it. We are this last generation. So God, Jesus himself, is talking to us, and he says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Are you awake or are you asleep? So then, because you are lukewarm, mm, just slumbering there, you're neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because I say, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not need, do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We're not just sleeping here, and we're not just slumbering. We're wretched, we're miserable, we're poor, we're blind, we're naked. This is really who we are. I counsel you then to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye staff that you may see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He's going to vomit, it, vomit us out. Did he tell them to buy something there? To buy gold? To purchase something, yes? Yeah? Okay, this is just another mm, of who we are. So these folks, these ten virgins, they've all come to the wedding. A great celebration, they're waiting for it. You know, I like parties. I really, I really like parties. And it's exciting to go to a party and to know you're getting ready for a party and all of it. But you know what happened? The bridegroom was delayed. This is a wedding party, but the bridegroom was delayed. There's no delay in getting out of Sodom. You either get out or you get burned up. So the angels aren't going to let them linger. They're going to do all they can in their power and they grab them. Lot and his family, and they drag them out. So what's it going to take for God to catch our attention and to do for us? We just studied Noah and um, the ark. And once, you know, this is really hard. Noah preached for 120 years. He did. And he built, the, he built this giant ark. And, every, and nobody had seen rain. And nobody had seen a giant flood. And none of like, this stuff had ever happened on the planet. But he, he persisted because he heard God's call on his life, and he did what he was supposed to do. Then the angel comes and gets the animals on, and then the angel comes and shuts the door. And then they sat there, and they're going, okay, rain's going to come, like any second now. But you know what? It was a delay. And so those, those family, that family was sitting inside that ark with those animals, honking and mooing and doing their thing and not what and you know why am I why am I in this little cage now where I never was before and and there's all this noise and there's noise from outside. The people are making fun of those people inside the ark. Oh yeah, where's the flood, Noah? Oh yeah, rain? Yeah, sure, you know, and just making fun of them. What do you think Noah is going through while he's hearing all this? Uh, trust. Hmm? He's sad. He he's sad. Yeah, he's wondering, is this real? What did he say? He was trusting God. He was trusting God, but it took it took some mm, to trust there, didn't it? You know? He said it's gonna come. He closed me in, but there's no rain. There's a delay. Jesus told us two thousand years ago, more than two thousand years ago, he's going to come soon. That's kind of sounds like a delay, and yet there's even gonna be like a time where it just 
is so clear it's a delay. But Jesus promises that if he didn't cut it short, all of us would be doomed. We would all go. And so he's going to cut it short for our sake. He doesn't want to spit us out. He doesn't want to bomb us out. So here we are. They are slumbering and sleeping. This is what slumbering is. Slumbering comes before deep sleep. Slumbering is sort of like drifting. You're drifting along. You're just moving along. You're just floating. They become drowsy. You know, it's just like they're just starting to lose it here. They're losing awareness. It's if, it, it is as if they're being lulled into forgetfulness. They're not part of today anymore. They're just slumbering. They're not fully aware of their surroundings any longer, and then they just fall asleep. Deep sleep. When the dreams, there is no longer urgency. There's no urgency. They're completely comfortable in their sleep. Should we be comfortable in our sleeping and our slumbering? He is saying urgent. The most needed thing right now is revival. Wake up. Wake up. There's no longer urgency to need to brighten when we're complacent like this and when we're careless and when we're slumbering and sleeping. Do you know what it comes down to? Superficial. It's like, are we for real or are we not for real? Did those kings and high priests get completely anointed or just partly anointed? You know, we need to be all in for God. Oh, during the darkest hours of the night, though, this is what happened. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Midnight, the darkest hour. Behold, the bridegroom was coming. Go out to meet him. Oh, they got awakened. Jesus is coming. Awake. He's coming. He's here. Get up. Get up. Wow, finally he's coming. Urgency happens again. They pick up. They get their stuff ready. They grab their, their little lanterns because it's midnight. It's dark. They plan, their plan is to meet the bridegroom and walk right into the marriage feast. And so what they did, they all got up. And then those, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And this is what it means to trim their lamps. So you have a lamp, and it's got a little wick in it, and it's got oil. And you put fire, and, and that little wick comes alive, and it soaks into that oil, and that oil keeps it alive. Well, while they slumbered and slept, do you know what happened to their oil? It disappeared. It burned out. There wasn't any. So now they're awake and they're trying to trim their lights. And why won't it light? And why won't it light? And then they realize there's no more oil in here. And so the wise virgins, they had a, a vessel. And they could pour it back into this. And they could have what they needed. And their lights came on. But these foolish virgins had none. And so they went. And they, um, they went to the others and they asked them for theirs. This is the way to say that they are trying to light their lamps. But remember, the foolish didn't have this oil. There wasn't enough to share from the others, and so they told them to go and buy some more. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. When we were reading about the Laodiceans, did, were they told to go and buy? Yeah, go and buy. Buy with what? I always wonder about How do you buy this? How do you buy the oil at midnight? You think Kauai rolls up at, you know, dusk or sundown? Israel rolled up. <laughs> there's nothing. There is no stores. There's nowhere where they can go and get the oil. What are they, what are people really thinking when they're telling them this? Tell them, go, you go buy. Go to the people who sell. Remember, it's midnight. Yet there was no choice. They had to go and they had to look for some. They're awake now. They're urgent. It's time because we don't want to miss out on that party. We don't want to get locked out of that door. We've already stated the oil is the Holy Spirit. How could they buy more of the Holy Spirit in their lives? And in such a short moment. This is becoming desperate. Will we be able to get it before the door of the feast is closed? Let's look back at the symbolism. Having the oil, having the Holy Spirit filling us, happens through time. The currency, what we need to buy this with, is time. So everyone has a measure of faith, everyone has a measure of the Spirit, and everyone has a measure of time. If you use the oil, more will be given to you. The more quality time you spend with God, the more oil is given. You have to give of your time. That's the currency. That's how we purchase these things. 
We need to have the gold right in the fire. We need to buy it. We need to spend the time learning our lessons, changing our, having our character change through the Holy Spirit living in us. This is where, when we spend this quality time, this is where we build our personal relationship with God. If you don't spend time with people and your family and your friends, you don't have a relationship. You have an acquaintance. Yeah, I know them. But how much do you know them? How intimate are you? Is it a personal relationship where you know each other and you know your family and your, and your desires and your heart's cry? Personal relationship. We cannot transfer a personal relationship. They could not share this oil with the other with the other virgin. They couldn't do it. It's their personal relationship. I can't share mine with you, and you can't share yours with me. But we have to have one, or we're not going to get into that door. It's urgent. We cannot transfer. We cannot share it. It's ours alone. Do we actually take the time to use our currency to build our relationships with Jesus? How do we use our time? Are we utilizing it wisely for God? Um, or do we just have time to, I know how easy it is to watch on your phone or to look at TV. You just go numb in a second and you're there. And it's just so easy to waste time. We don't have any time to waste. I mentioned Ukraine. Those people don't have time to waste. They're running for their life. They're trying to find food and water. They're trying to get medicine. It's urgent for them. It's urgent for us. We are in a war. And the war, the battle is coming. We're just in a really quiet time right now, right here. But it's not going to stay like this. We need to build our relationship. We need to use this currency of time wisely. Do we allow the light of the Spirit to guide us into God's presence, where we are drawn closer and closer to Him? Do we behold His loveliness? Do we become more intimate with Him, more like Him, more healed, more in love? Do we spend time in prayer, time in reading his love letter to us? They had the Bible, it's in their hands. Do we take the time to minister and share his love with others? You know, these kids that are coming to do VBS over here, it's a mission trip for them. They're taking their summer hours. They're going to share their time with us to bless our children. It takes time. Time is a, it's a real effort if you're going to give time. You know, Delhi taught Sabbath school. He didn't get that this morning. He took time out all week to study and to prepare for that. It takes time. We need to invest our time with God and draw closer to Him, building on this love relationship with Him and with each of us. And this is why we gather together in church. We're a family and we need to unite and commune together and draw closer to each other. Should we do this as if our life depended on it? Yeah, because our eternal life does depend on it. Are we going to spend this money wisely? Are we going to do, are we going to be urgent about what he tells us is the most urgent of all our needs? To revive, to come alive, to be awake, to understand what we've been brought into. We are blessed above measure here. We are. We're the most blessed people on this planet. I, I have no doubt about it. We have truth and we have understanding and we have spirit prophecy and we have the Holy Spirit. And we have freedom, and we have liberty, and we have a beautiful place to live, and a beautiful church, and electricity. We are so blessed. Food. You know what? We were missing something in our food. We went grocery shopping yesterday, and they didn't have it. And it put the weirdest feeling in me. What if we'll never get it again? You know, it's just like, it was one thing. Because the, you know, the thing hasn't come yet. The bar hasn't come, and it's not there. But little by little, things are going to start disappearing on us. What are we going to replace? How are we going to use that time and that energy and that time? What are we going to do with it? Have we been changed by our time with Jesus so that when someone sees us, they see Him? Do they see His image displayed to us? For by beholding, we become changed. What do we do with this time? When the delay was over and He did arrive, you know, they woke up. Oh, He's coming. The bridegroom's coming. Wake up. So they did. They got up. It was a surprise to them because they'd been deep asleep. They awoke. They recognized the urgency of the time, and they started scrambling to do what was necessary. But was it enough? Were they in time? Verses 10 through 12 tell us, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, those who were ready, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. If God shut the door, did he open it? Not at all. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. 
But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. This is church members he's talking to. I do not know you. I want us to go back in with Matthew to Matthew 7. This is how Jesus starts Matthew, and this is how Jesus ends Matthew. But Matthew 7. Twenty-one, Matthew seven, twenty-one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, if we're saying, Lord, Lord, who are we? Christians. Christian. Who are saying, Lord, Lord, here, open the door to us? Christians. Okay. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What is his will? That we Service. study his Bible. Service taking care of other people, ministering to them, feeding the, you know, the... TSA saw somebody the other day just look so down, sitting on the ground, and he went and bought him two sandwiches, and he said, that, that boy ate that sandwich so fast, like he couldn't get the wrapper off fast enough. That's how hungry that boy was. People all around us are in need. They don't have the truth. They don't have understanding. They don't have hope in their hearts. 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. What did he say here? I don't know you, period. Here he says at the beginning, you have a chance here. I want you to find the law. I want you to find these blessings in your life of how to love me and how to serve me. And at the end, he just says flat out, I'm not even going to tell you there's a law anymore. I'm just going to tell you I don't know you. It's over with. Probation is over. Sad. Oh, sad. These foolish, foolish virgins. You know, that's why it just, it breaks my heart over our children that aren't walking with the Lord because I'm just so afraid that this is what's going to happen for them. You know, that the door is going to be shut. And, and I'm going, oh. you know, there's a time probation closes. It was all within their grasp, was it not? Weren't they church members? Didn't they have the Bible? Wasn't the Holy Spirit right there for their purchase? Everything was there for them, but they didn't grasp it. They didn't take it. Instead, they slumbered and they slept. There was no seriousness, no urgency here. They liked being part of the church, yeah. They showed up, because after all, today's Sabbath, right? Better go to church. But really, was this just superficial Christianity, a form of religion? Pretense. The bridegroom knew his true friends and his intimate companion. He opened the door, he invited them in, but these foolish ones, this is what he told them. Maybe. This is what he told them. Assuredly. That means beyond any any doubt. There's nothing else I can say about it. I do not know you. I do not know you. Do you want that to be said of us? I don't, and I don't want it said for any of us. I want us all to be there. I want us all to walk in. And you know, it's so easy to get lost, and it's so easy to get complacent. And this is why he reminds us. This is why we have the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a reminder. Who's your creator? How did you get here? Who are you, actually? You know, you're just a person that I'm caring for. You owe every breath to me. Pay attention. Now surely, I, don't, I, I do not know you is not what we want to hear. Oh, what heartache that must be. Can you imagine, you know, one time when we became Adventists and we learned these truths, and I read um, The Great Controversy. Oh, I just studied that book so much, and I thought, okay, this happens, and then this happens, and this happens. And one night, me and TC were out, and we were coming back from the store, and this meteor shower happened. And we didn't know a meteor shower was going to come. <laughs> and we thought Jesus was coming and we missed it. <laughs> just, our hearts just sank to our toes and we just, oh, we were crying and everything. Oh! And just and the agony that went through our hearts and it was just a meteor shower. <laughs> but we thought we were lost. And, and that's what I kept thinking. What did I miss in the great controversy? <laughs> what is the one thing I missed? How come we didn't know this? We don't want that. We don't want any kind of feelings like that. We want to be assured. We want to walk confidently with God. We want to be completely committed to Him. And do you know what? If we are, do you know what that Holy Spirit will do? 
He will live the life of Christ through us. We don't even have to think about it. It will just happen. Let each of us commit to follow the bridegroom's counsel to us found in verse 13. Watch therefore. Watch therefore. Watching? Does that mean you're sleeping? Not at all. It means watch, be aware, understand the urgency of the times. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And if we think that um, this is just something we need to pay attention to, you know, there's Christians that are not in this church. There's Christians in other denominations all around the world. And do you know, I pay attention to Christians around the world. I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know where they're at in their, in their walk and what they're teaching. I want to know that. I, it, it matters to me. Because if I understand that, then I can understand when I talk to them what I should or shouldn't say or bring up. Because you have an understanding of where they're at. Do you know where they're at right now? They are, they are screaming for revival. They are doing everything in their power worldwide to bring revival to the Christian faith. That's what they're doing. On, this, on September 26th, they're going to have a worldwide day of prayer and revival around the world. They're setting up big tent um, ministries like Colorado is going to be like a, a center point. They're doing, they, they feel the urge. Why shouldn't we feel the urge? We have the last day's message. We have the three angels. They don't have it. The three angels is what's going to take us into that final, you know, Babylon has fallen. It's fallen. Get out of here, my people. But they don't know it. And so there is false revival and there is real revival. And we need to be revived. We need to. We are complacent. I'm telling you, we are. We should be so on fire that nothing should stop us from speaking out every chance we get to share the love of God with others. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We don't have a clue, but we do have signs. And he gave us those specifically so we wouldn't be just in la-la land. We wouldn't be lost. We'd be, oh, there's a sign. Oh, it just happened. There's a sign. Do you know that they've all happened? They're all pretty much done. It's just waiting for Jesus to step out and to come and get us now. We're waiting for that midnight cry. Behold, he's here. He's coming. Family, leave. Let's pray that our eyes are open, that we're enlightened by the Holy Spirit, so that we will not only be aware of the time, that we're in, but that we will have invested the currency of time given to us in search of God and not wasted this money. So we are told in Jeremiah 29, 11, 13, this is so beautiful, this is God's part to us. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, not to lock you out of the door. I want you there. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Total consecration. Get anointed. Allow the Holy Spirit to cover us, to fill us, to saturate us. Because, Jesus warned one more time, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house this vessel, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And praise God, it is soon, it is very, very soon. Amen. Shall we pray? Loving Father, we are so grateful that you have warned us. Thank you for pouring your love on us. Thank you for pouring your grace and your mercy and your tenderheartedness on us. We hear here in Jeremiah that you want us. And you tell us, just come looking for you. Please help us to find you 100% so that nothing is slack here, nothing is lacking, and that we belong only to you. Thank you so much in Jesus' loving name. Amen. And um, now, if you would, please stand. And then...